to Spotlights. This is the podcast for the Yale Forum on Religion and Ecology. And as usual, I'm your host, Sam Mickey. And this week, I'm really happy to welcome onto the program, Mark Porter. Mark, thanks for making time for us. It's a pleasure. I'm really glad to be here. Yeah, I'm really uh, looking forward to talking with you. Um, and just a brief bio, you're a research associate at the University of Erfurt in Erfurt, Germany, and working there with their Department of uh, Theology and Religious Studies. And, uh, and you have a doctorate in ethnomusicology. And so yeah. you're working at an intersection uh, that's really interested me for a long time. I've uh, never tried to pull these threads together, but it's music, ecology, spirituality. It's kind of musico, spiritual, ecological kind of intersection. Um, so really cool stuff. And I'm looking forward to chatting with you about it. Uh, you have a, a book out about this called Ecologies of Resonance in Christian Musicking. And- well, um, I- Actually, just to, to, to come in there, so that, that, that book's actually got a slightly misleading title when we come to these themes. And, and so that one is actually not on the theme of um, environments. And that, that's sort of a prelude to my environmental work, sort of playing on the different possibilities for that word. So, um, yeah, I appreciate that. that. Yeah, because ecology is so much more than just the environment and think of relationships and interactions. And um, so, yeah, I'd be curious to hear a little about what's in that book. But you have this uh, forthcoming book. This should be out maybe the spring. Um, I'm told June at the moment. Okay, we'll so that see. that'll be on the cusp somewhere around uh, late spring, early summer, yeah. and uh, with a really beautiful title for the warming of the earth, music, faith, and ecological crisis. Um, so I'm excited to talk about this. But first, I always want to hear uh, just kind of like your origin story. How did you get into the work that you do? Because it's not necessarily an intuitive connection to be thinking about environmental issues, to be thinking about music and thinking about religion, looking at all those things relating to one another. Uh, so how did you come to this? Yeah, I mean, not intuitive at all. And it's a, a slightly winding path, I would say. I mean, th- these have been different themes in my life for a long time. As a, as a child growing up on a, a beautiful island, um, themes of the environment and the natural world were obviously important to me there, but then the music became my main thing for a, for a long time. And I, I studied that in different ways and did a lot of research on Christian communities, experiences of music within them, how they negotiate different ways of doing that, what it means to different people in terms of values, emotions, all those kinds of things. Um, And then as I was doing my doctorate, this theme of um, eco-musicology crossed my path. And I think it was a, I can't remember exactly what the lecture was on. It was something to do with musical instrument making and and wood and sustainable sourcing and traditional music cultures. And I was in some ways slightly excited to see this lecture, to see what it was doing. And then I went to it and I was a little bit disappointed I, I wanted ecology and music to be a little bit more than than just materials and how they used and that didn't really connect with with what I was doing. Um, but then a couple of years later, I sort of done a bit more research and and the pandemic came along and I didn't have um, I didn't have any job at that that point. I had a series of sort of short term academic postdoctoral contracts. And I was wondering what to do. And I wasn't really thinking about doing a research project. But then on my social media feed, I started seeing different Christian groups that were beginning to draw together music um, and climate or ecology in in some way. Mm. And I was really fascinated by the fact they were doing that, uh, um, what it meant to do that, because I didn't have any clue what it meant to bring those things together and so I mean at the time yeah in the pandemic I was spending a lot of time walking out in the hills sort of observing insects plants and things that I thought this is a world I like I I I want to do something here and so I started having a couple of conversations those conversations snowballed I ended up having 40 or 50 different conversations with different people about what they were doing and slowly began immersing myself in it and finding it more exciting and um yeah, that turned into a research project. The research project turned into also teaching with students, which helped mm. me to explore other facets of it. Um, and it's just been this research journey of exploring something which I, I didn't really know much about, but which I loved. And that's just a wonderful journey to go on, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's great to to 
see how the kind of tragedy of the pandemic that opened up an opportunity for a kind of new research project and uh, and one that really touches on you know the biggest challenges of our time and that's uh you know revolving around uh, global warming and i wonder you know one of the things that i always think about when i think about religion and music is how there's a lot of silence emphasized in religion and it's not always about music and so i know you write about that a little bit in your earlier book um and the kind of like ascetic struggles and the monk alone in their cell and those kinds of things so i wonder if you could say a little about the tension between sound and silence to begin with so b before we get more into music i always want to mm -hmm. honor silence what's what's the deal with that kind of tension yeah well i mean in in some ways you, it's hard to talk about that without talking about music because the minute you start talking about sound and silence you're also sort of bringing categories of music into question right you're saying what is music what is sound what is sounding what's it all about and it's it's asking those very basic questions of sort of stepping aside from those categories and those genres and those those things that we do and um and going to another place and, and silence is this sort of fascinating thing that can that can do a lot silence is this kind of i mean we construct it in different ways it can become a, a relationship it can i mean in the ascetic tradition i think to do with stillness to do with the passions and i think you, you mentioned the, those things sort of stuff I've done about monks in the in the desert and um, they're also a relationship to landscape right and uh, it is the desert a noisy place is it a silent place how do we imagine that and what does that mean for what what's going on there and and that's a theme that's come up there and it's it's come up again in my research with um, different Christian groups as well particularly with um with forest church groups mm. where where they're going into natural spaces and natural spaces um inverted commas and wondering what kind of music and sound they want to do or don't want to do in those spaces and then that question of okay should we be sounding should we be making music um, is sound and music, is that a form of power? What does it mean for the balance and relationship between different entities and beings? Um, there's all these questions that are springing up the moment you you open up that kind of category. Right, right. Yeah, it reminds me of one of my favorite pieces uh, is by the American composer John Cage, right? Uh, Four minutes, 33 seconds, which is just silence. And yet the whole thing as well, is it silence really? And all the ambient <clears throat> sounds in the room people shifting in their chairs, all that kind of stuff that ends up being part of it. So it's hard to actually locate silence. Yeah, I mean, that's um, it's a piece that came up a lot in my um, undergraduate studies. Mm -hmm. And I think the first time I encountered it was with a, a little bit of cynicism as to what I think about it. And of course, coming from a slightly snobby classical music, historical musicology background you sort of want to dismiss that kind of thing and say it's a stunt yeah. and okay maybe it's pointing to something important um but then you spend more and more time focusing on music and sound as things that are really about your state of being in the world and, and those relationships you're forming with things around you and actually that kind of piece begins to make a lot more sense yeah. um and I, I think cage was someone that connected that kind of stuff um also to a sense of spirituality in, in different ways he was certainly playing with different um mystical traditions and things over the course of his his career yeah yeah no, that's a good point yeah and i think maybe zen buddhism was in the mix there for him and uh yeah and i think i think that's the normal way to respond to it is initially being a little cynical toward it and like okay this is cute and it's a fun stunt and the more you get into it oh, there's something going on there uh, well, you know, you mentioned uh, forest churches, and I know you're talking about them um, in the new book. So I wonder if you could say, what are these forest churches? Because I'm not sure if our uh, listeners or, or viewers are familiar with it. I'm sure some people are, but I'm, I'm guessing a lot of folks aren't. Yeah, so forest churches, they're, they're one of a, a number of different sort of groups and movements I study in the book. Um, and I mean, I call them forest churches, but there's a whole range of terminology here. There's forest church, there's wild church, there's mossy church, muddy church, um, uh, probably others that I, I, I'm missing there. 
and it's a, it's a movement in the UK, I think also a little bit in the States, but under different names and different guises. Um, to, I'm trying to think how far it dates back, probably about 10, 15 years, its origins. Um, an impulse to say, okay, we've, we've been worshiping buildings for a long time. Uh, what happens if we go out in nature and do Christian rituals or... I mean, maybe this category of Christianity is one it slightly brings into question because they, they sort of interface with pagan traditions in the in the UK and with other forms of sort of nature spirituality and, and they sort of open those boundaries a bit. But they're going out into the world and saying there's lots of people that in, are used to talking about encountering God through nature. What if we take that as our starting point? And so when when we do something there, where we're not going to try and transfer our indoor rituals into outdoor spaces. Mm -hmm. We're going to say we're in an outdoor space now. What does it mean to take that space and those things around us as a starting point for our act of worship or, or meditation? Maybe worship isn't always the right word there. Um, and that takes various different forms. Uh, some groups, it'll be about going on a going on a walk some there'll be a little bit of input someone talking drawing your attention to different things around you reading poems maybe performing different acts together one of the things that was really common when I was visiting different forest church groups was you'd have a little bit of uh, sort of impulse at the start okay where are we in the year what's happening now with the seasons with the things around us what's maybe a theme for this week then they sort of send you out for 15, 20 minutes uh, to go find a space on your own and then ask this question, what is what is God saying to me through these mm. things around me? Mm. Um, and then come back and sort of share some of that. What, what was God saying to you through the natural world? Um, and I... I mean, that's that was a slightly interesting experience for me visiting these groups to try out what is it? Do, I, I'm there in this space. I'm looking at a leaf. Do, do I think God is saying something to me through this leaf? Mm. Um, could I imagine what God might be saying to me through this leaf? Um, I probably can. I can probably invent something. Should I be inventing something? Or all these kinds of questions sort of start whirring through your head. It's it's a really interesting space to to be in, and I think that's a space that some people take too much more naturally than than others. Right. Yeah, I can imagine some people immediately kind of connect to that kind of practice, and other people are like, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing right now, <laughs> and it's because yeah. it's new. It's it's definitely innovating, and I also appreciate you mentioning how it's. Uh, even kind of puts the category of Christianity into question because of the way it's integrating uh, sort of pagan practices and things like that. And uh, so that's, you know, part of what's interesting about this whole project is it's, you're talking about Christianity, but it's also like opening up new possibilities for what Christianity even is. Yeah. So it's a project that's deliberately focusing on this idea of innovation and change to say that the climate crisis is something that spurs that innovation and change in what we're doing. Um, because we realize in many ways the world is changing and maybe we need to be changing too. Uh, but also something like the climate crisis, like the ecological, other ecological crisis around us, it's, it's something that Christians and other believers from different religions or, or non-believers have in, have in common. I mean, we're all facing this together. And the, the minute you start raising that as the main issue rather than yeah to know jesus or, right. or salvation or, or, or something then then the, these crossovers become much more obvious and easy you realize okay where i have this theme in common with a range of other groups and, and people and traditions and maybe we can share something there in, in some way right yeah it's um one of the kind of poignant parts of the the ecological crisis in general climate change in particular it's clearly very bad news and yet it's also providing this way for people to come together and provides a, a deeper commonality and so even though it's a terrible problem it also helps us reorient ourselves so that we have uh, more in common than we do different and in terms of the history of religions often there's so much tension between traditions and then this this crisis might be a way for people to to come together 
Um, well, and, you know, one of the things uh, in terms of innovation is that people have albums oriented around climate change. So I know mm -hmm. you write about climate albums. And so I was surprised to learn that, like, why well, I can imagine people would drop a few lyrics in here or there. But to think of climate albums, that's a really new way of thinking about what kind of theme you should have for an album. Yeah. And I mean, I think ecological albums outside of the religious world is maybe not such an odd thing. I think right. we sort of expect the composers or, or singer songwriters or, or people might have done that. Um, the main surprise to me was to find that evangelical groups were doing it because yeah. you think, okay, evangelical worship is is really not the place you expect to find yeah. those kinds of Probably things. the last place um, I would expect it. And I mean, there the were two two different groups that I sort of spent a bit of time in conversation with. So one is a, a group of songwriters in, in the UK, uh, Resound Worship. They're sort of online collective. They have various um, projects and challenges to, to get people as part of their community to, to write songs. And they're, they're a little bit on the fringes of the mainstream. They're not, I mean, they're not like Hillsong. They're not going to be streaming millions of times for everything they write, but they're, they're trying to write into themes which are a little bit on the edge. Uh, and then with um, some conversations with the Porter's Gate, which is a, in some ways a similar movement in the US, it's a mm. bit ecumenical. So, I mean, Resound Worship are perhaps more evangelical, Porter's Gate a bit more... Um, yeah, ecumenical, but still using popular music genres. And and so I, I got in contact with, with some of them early on in the album writing process to find, okay, what are you doing here? What are you what are you thinking? Why why are you doing this? How are you writing this? Is it is this even possible? Um and I think they a lot of them struggled with the same kinds of questions, right? You're you're worshiping a you're worshiping, you're, you're writing a worship song and you have this traditional sort of trajectory of verse, which says, I don't know, maybe establishes um, some themes, um, gives you a focus, builds up through a pre-chorus, chorus, praise God, praise God, yeah. um, back down to a verse. And, and you have this expected pattern and, and that pattern has particular goals. It's, yeah, you're meant to be directing yourself towards God, not not towards the environment, not towards other beings so much. I mean, they can be in there, but they're only there to point you towards God. Um, and you're probably also, I mean, if you're in the more charismatic tradition, you're expecting to have some kind of encounter through that, some kind of spiritual experience, maybe. You're meant to be authentic. You're meant to be expressing yourself, your deepest emotions. Uh, and so what does it mean to bring ecological themes into that and when, when I was talking to them people had a whole range of different sort of approaches a lot of them said okay yeah I struggled a bit at first I didn't know mm. what to do I wrote songs which didn't feel like they they worked as songs mm. uh, because they struck up too far against the conventions and expectations of the genre I guess and then over the course of these conversations, okay, people began to find different acts, access points, different entry points to bring these things together. You realize, okay, um, there are little contact points between this genre and between ecological themes. They can build them in. And they do that and they, they produce these albums. And I mean, I have slightly mixed feelings about the albums. In some ways, I, I really love them as, as these sort of really slightly strange, but but fun and fascinating and actually quite useful projects, which which try to bring people on board with these themes, which would not normally come on board. On the other hand, there are albums which I, I look at and think, okay, does this go as far as we need to go in, in, if, if we're gonna rework all our, our logics and all our structures to, to face this sort of climate crisis we're, we're facing? Can, can I really just, add that as a theme in these worship songs and expect that to be enough. Um, mm. but there's a pragmatic part of me that says maybe it's not enough, but even if it's not enough, it, it's still doing something there. It's, it's people that it's sparking, people it's meaning something for, people it's helping to um, bring an extra step on the journey. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, that's that's an ambivalence I feel toward a lot of things related to uh, climate change because I mean climate change is such an immense problem that requires just a massive overhaul of society. And then mm -hmm. so you see something you're like, well, that's not going to be enough. <laughs> and, then, and, and yet it's like, well, something's better than nothing. But wouldn't it be nice if it was more? Um, and speaking of more, I think, you know, one of the things that um, people are always looking for is not just um, new forms of art or things like that or personal experiences. People want uh, activism. They want the protest. And so you get into this as well in your research, the way that uh, this kind of intersection of music, climate and faith uh, also has an element of, of protest to it. You've got a lovely way of smoothly moving between my different um, <laughs> chapters there. Um, yeah, I mean, protest, of course. Um, and I, I think we've got very used to ecological protests over the last, um, I'm trying to think, is it last five? It's more than five years, isn't it? But not quite 10. I, I don't know. Yeah. I, I, I feel that the climate movement has slowly built up yeah. um, over sometime over the last decade. Uh, but we're not necessarily quite so used to connecting that with religion or definitely not with religious music. Yeah. Um, so, so movements like, for example, Extinction Rebellion, they have, they have an underlying spirituality to them. They, they deliberately are, I mean, that, that movement is artistic and it, it builds spiritual practices into what it's doing. Um, and then the the group I was working with, so Christian Climate Action in the in the UK, they're mm. a sort of subgroup within that. Mm. And I was really interested to see what they were doing when they were bringing music along to their protests, because they were they're actually doing a, a lot of very creative stuff. Mm. Um, so they're they're there. They're trying to build a bridge between faith and protest to say as as believers, yeah, we believe this protest is important and standing up for what we believe there is important. And I mean, they sometimes make headlines, particularly when, when a vicar goes along and gets arrested as part of a, a thing that, that can, that can be quite a nice symbol to latch on to. If right. even a vicar is getting arrested, that must be something important. Um, and, and so I saw, okay, they're producing a songbook to use at some of their events. Well, what does that mean for them? Well, I discovered using using music at these kinds of protests, a lot of it, it's very pragmatic stuff. It's about em managing emotions. It's about stopping things getting violent. It's about making people feel part of something. It's about um, creating a sense of meaning for the people there. It's about doing something that other people can hear and maybe latch on to, maybe be surprised by. And there's a whole range of different tasks it can perform because there's, when you're out in these public spaces, there's a whole range of different people you can encounter. You can encounter people that are on board with your movement, that are on board, but from a different perspective. There's the people you're sort of protesting against, the bystanders, the sympathetic ones, the not so sympathetic ones. And to say we know what music is going to do in that space is quite a hard thing to, yeah. to say. Um, but but they come up with these little strategic things. So, for example, one of the last um, interviews I did, and one I found most fun was there's a group of three. Um, I'm going to insult them if I call them old. Um, three, <laughs> three, three women at a later stage in their their careers, or I think That's good. probably one or two of them were retired who who went along to a, a shell shareholders meeting in um in london to protest and they they were telling me the story they wanted to do something there and they were wondering what they can do that's going to be disruptive but might also have a spiritual meaning also has a sense of ecumenical um possibility rather than i mean they're an ecumenical movement you don't want to do something that's going to alienate one group of Christians because they can't get on board with it. Right. Um, and, and they said they very quickly landed on singing. Hmm. And when they were thinking about singing, they thought, okay, we're gonna do, we're gonna sing Amazing Grace. Um, it's something everyone knows and it has this whole background to do with justice, to do with slavery, right. to do with colonial histories and things. And so they thought, okay, that has a sense of meaning to it. 
And then they start deciding, okay, but we're going to do a bit more with that. We're going to rework the words a little bit so that some of these words start speaking about what it means to drill oil, start talking about how a company like Shell or what they're doing fits into this narrative of, of salvation. or mm. and, and so it becomes an act of disruptive protest, but at the same time, something that's meant to be a kind of authentic spirituality. It's not protest as opposition. It's a form of protest that says, actually, we care and we're praying and we're bringing this before God there. And then they were telling me there were this policeman standing next to them and they they didn't really, the policemen were a bit sort of confused what to do. And you can't really, you've got three innocent looking ladies standing on chairs singing Christian songs and and praying. Do you do you just arrest them? No, that looks a bit weird. And no. they, they they sort of enjoyed that dynamic and how they could disconcert these um this dynamic a bit. Um and then they said, okay, and we started praying for the policeman, and that was actually quite a touching experience. And and there's a whole range of other different actions. Another one was on pilgrimage up to COP26 in Glasgow. Mm -hmm. Um, where they, one, one of the protesters there, I don't think it was just her alone, but it was mainly her sort of um, had this project, sort of art project to build a coat, a coat called the Code of Hopes, which had these different patchworks on it, which I think were sort of added to over the course of the journey. Um, and the idea was that as they went on this journey, they were sort of invite different people to to wear this coat and to, to see what it meant to sort of, wear that and, and perform that slightly ritual action there's as they were doing that to sort of give that a bit more meaning this this coat had a song um and it was sort of this call and response ask me where i'm going um actually i can't remember all the lyrics i i should get them <laughs> i should have had them up on the screen um but sort of this this question and answer, what what's this all about? And this is what's happening. And this sort mm. of telling of a story. And, and that helped create a sense of meaning and togetherness for the pilgrimage and mm. and really sort of sustained some of them in, in a little way along the route. Yeah, that makes I can sense. tell hundreds of similar stories about different different things, but that yeah. gives an idea. Well, that's a, one of the fun parts of the book is it's just so full of so many different examples and uh, and to realize this isn't just like an isolated incident of, oh, there was one person over here who thought maybe music, spirituality, climate kind of fit together. Like now it seems like it's it's actually a very widespread phenomenon. Yeah, which really surprised me at first. Um and I think in some traditions, it's more visible and more central than mm. others. But also uh, over the course of the project, I think a lot of the people I was getting in contact with were, were very grassroots people. They're not necessarily, I mean, some of them are more prominent. I mean, I talked with um, well, one of the composers I, I talked to in one of the chapters. I think he um, he's sung at the King's cor coronation. He has... Um, oh, wow. He has status. There are people there that have status, but a, a lot of these people are people that aren't even musicians. They're just mm -hmm. thinking, okay, we we can try something out. We can we want to do something. Let let's have a play. Let's fiddle with something. Let's um, adjust that. Let's let's play with these lyrics. So we know a tune there. We think that has a bit of meaning, but we don't quite like that. What if we if we do that? And and, and they're generating these these practices and they're trying them out and they're seeing who else latches onto them um, right. and where they can mean something for people. Yeah. And I also appreciate how it's not uh, oppositional in the way that some forms of activism and protest can be. I mean, like the case of amazing grace or like, well, they're praying for us. They're singing a song. So you can't get mad. It would seem kind of inappropriate to, whereas in, in contrast to like people, you know, throwing tomato soup on a Van Gogh painting and things like that. It's like, well, that seems like this very oppositional, defiant kind of thing, which has its own place as well. Of course, not trying to dismiss that kind of activism, but it is important to be a little more uniting and less dividing sometimes. And it seems like music has that way of bringing people together. And so it's not just activism as critique and you're just mad, but there's a joy to it. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think so. Um, I, I don't want to say that music is always this sort of wonderful, uniting and, right. and joyful thing. It can have an oppositional character to it, but the, its ability to operate on an emotional level, its ability to do something with relationships, um, and also its ability to have this sort of spiritual dimension to it, I think are, are really key. And um, yeah. they can definitely be used in very harmonic ways. And I, I think a lot of the people I'm, I'm talking to want to do that. They want to bring people on board. They don't want to alienate them. And I, I think that's part of, for many of them, that's part of their their Christian heritage they sort of believe that's what people of faith should be doing um, but it's also part of the the practices um yeah 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 it makes me think of uh the uh, climate scientist Catherine Hayhoe uh she's Canadian but she um is living in Texas right now and she's an evangelical Christian and when people think of evangelicals in Texas they think of climate deniers and uh but she's a climate scientist and she as an evangelical is always trying to bring people together so whether you're on the left or right side of the political spectrum, whatever faith you have. And so she's even spoken to oil executives and will begin by saying, first of all, I love oil. It's provided a lot in my life. We have all the good things in our society have oil at their base. So and then people came up to her afterward and like, hey, thanks. You didn't make us feel like the bad guy. And if we mm -hmm. can have some way to talk to people about these issues or sing to people about these issues where they don't feel like they're just being given a kind of guilt trip or being demonized or something, then I, I feel like we can really mobilize uh, a lot more action. Yeah, and that's really one of the key questions, right? How do we bring people on board? And yeah. how do we, because that's what we need. <laughs> we we yeah. need more people on board right now. And um, I mean, can read that as pure cynical strategy, but right. I mean, it's nice at the same time, yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. That's is that just strategy? It's like, well, a little, little, but it's also faith. And uh, well, I wonder um, if you could say a little about some of the uh, festivals because uh, uh, there's just so much in the book, so much uh, great mm -hmm. research, so many good stories. But I enjoyed hearing a little bit about the uh, the song festivals. Yeah, so the song festivals they were one of the sort of last things I, I came to do some research on. And um, part of the way that came up was I, I'd started this new job at a, a Catholic theology faculty. And I was, I'm not from a Catholic background and I'd sort of started this research project already. And I was thinking, okay, I should find out what the Catholics are doing here. <laughs> I, I, I haven't done much work with them. What What's going on? And um, as I was doing that, I came across uh, a couple of online events um, a couple of Vatican song festivals centered around Laudato Si. And I thought, okay, this is a slightly odd idea to me as a as a Protestant. Why why are people doing music and song festivals based around an encyclical? Yeah. <laughs> because that 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 feels weird. Yeah. Why why <laughs> how? I, I sort of, I had it in my head, an encyclical is a sort of official document. I don't really expect it to have much of a sense of um, spirituality to it. In, well, I mean, of course, it comes from, from the Pope. It has some spirituality, but not necessarily the kind of spirituality you can enact in a, in a ritual or in, a, or in music. Um, and so I was fascinated by what they were doing. And, and so I... Um, I didn't visit the the festivals in person. I sort of followed them online because that was the way most of the world experienced them. And I think both events, I'm not sure whether there's more than two now, but the two I, two I sort of looked at, I think they last a, an hour, a couple of hours. And over the course of an evening, you sort of have a, a presenter and a, a team sort of based on the ground. I think one in the CC, one in the other one in Rome hmm. with a nice view over the city and and they have an evening sort of with interviews with competitions and as you go through the evening every what five or ten minutes or so there's a different song and the songs are from different Catholic groups around the world who or, or individuals who have been 
in some way inspired by Laudato Si to write music. Um, and there's a massive range there. I mean, most of them are in popular styles, but there's some sort of very simple ones with just a single repeated phrase. I mean, often they take this phrase from the beginning of the um, Laudato Si text, um, sort of praise to you, lords, through, with, all your creatures. I, I can't remember the exact exact wording, but that, that translates very, very naturally into a song. But hooking a whole range of different different projects. So none of them wrote songs specifically for these festivals, but you find, okay, the Catholic Church is this worldwide network, and it's not just oh. churches, it's different communities, um, different different projects, different people, different different groups, and some of them are writing songs to engage with young people, to express their fears, their emotions, their hopes. Some of them are writing songs for worship. Some of them are, are writing them in collaboration with um, people from outside of Catholicism. Some are making YouTube videos because they, um, they're influencers and they that's what they do. Um, and, and you sort of see that this festival then is, is a festival of music, but the music then points to this massive network of, of projects and action going on at so many different levels of the Catholic hierarchy. And, and that for me was, a, again, a really fascinating process of discovery because I, I heard some of these songs and I thought, oh, this song is a bit naff. I, I, don't, I don't think this song really is something I find that exciting. <laughs> Um, but then you you start having the conversations with the people and you see the work that the song is connected to. And then you think, actually, wow, th th these things are hooking into a whole range of different dynamics and different occasions. And they're, they're, they're doing different work um, and they're, they're doing more than just music. And that, that, that was one of the key things to sort of discover, OK, music isn't this isolated thing, which is about aesthetic experience and singing and theology or whatever it's, it's this thing that that hooks into other programs of action and it becomes part of that working together part of that motivation to action part of that um, expression of identity all those things that are needed to, to make something happen and to make people feel that they're, they're doing something that is meaningful and and, and and together right yeah it's it's strange to me, um, the excitement around Laudato Si. And I have a Catholic background. And even for me, I'm like, well, this is weird. Normally encyclicals, average folks aren't reading them at all. And uh, and then if you do, you go, okay, that was interesting, but it's not gonna like spark a movement and certainly not new forms of artistic creativity and things like that. And so it really is quite a remarkable document, uh, the way that it uh, lights up people, including uh, non-Catholics and even non-Christians. I know, um, I have a colleague who's fully atheist, materialistic kind of person. He's like, I read that. That is an amazing document. I love it. And, you know, you're like, well, I had something about that just it lights people up in an interesting way. So, yeah, the fact that it turns into um, whole festivals of celebrating that uh, message through music is, is really very remarkable. Yeah. And I wonder, I mean, I've done... I, I tried to read into a lot of the background of Art Laudato to see, but I, I and some of the different responses. I, I I wonder whether part of that excitement is simply you don't expect a document like that to be coming from the Catholic Church. It's not just reiterating a social teaching where you think this is what the Catholic Church always drones on about. We're fed up of hearing them. It's something where you think, wow, they're going in a new direction here. This is, I mean, they were. Catholics will, of course, connect that to long traditions of care for the environment and, and the world. But but to the rest of us, I think there's an element of surprise there. And that surprise creates a bit of excitement. Yeah. And uh, and I don't you know, I teach at a Catholic university and there's a whole initiative to try and integrate the principles of Laudato Si into Catholic universities. And and so people are just really, really motivated by it. And so it is like that's that's different. And even though there is certainly a tradition of care for the environment, there is that surprise of like, yeah, well, Pope Francis took it to took it to a new level. So yeah, yeah. pretty, pretty amazing. Um, well, geez, one of the things I want to bring up because, you know, earlier I was talking about uh, the, the joyous aspect of music and the kind of celebratory nature of it. And uh, you're like, well, it's not always that way. And so I wanted to make sure to honor that uh, you definitely address that in the book. But in some cases, it's not about joy at all. In fact, it's about 
of very difficult emotional experiences. It's about grieving. And uh, you talk about ecological requiems. Um, so mm -hmm. I wonder if you could say a little about uh, how that figures into your project. Yeah, I mean, I think this theme of climate grief and climate anxiety is on the radar for lots yeah. of us. There's a, a lot of research going on in that area over the over recent years. Um, and climate requiems, ecological requiems, requiems for lost species, uh, seem to be becoming an increasingly common thing. And, and that's not just for Christian groups, that's for protest movements, that's for artists. And they're, they're taking this, this word this and this form that, that has got a long cultural history, a long religious, a long spiritual history. And they're saying this offers us something that we can do something with here to process what we're going through. And they do a whole range of different things with that. It, it becomes this, this resource you can then turn into something. And, and what do you do? Do you, I mean, one of the great things about a requiem in its traditional form is that it's a piece of liturgy uh, that, that tells a story. And it goes through these different stages, these different moments, these different movements that they're all doing something different, right? You're, you're confessing, you're facing judgment, you're getting a sense of peace, you're, you're doing all these different things. And, and there's a sense there's multiple entry points you can play with there and a, a story you can play with there in different ways. Um, and so a couple of different groups I had conversations with, um, about some recent requiem projects, uh, one based at Canterbury Cathedral in, in the UK, and one was a, a Christian age project. And I mean, slightly odd projects to talk about in that neither of them actually got realized in the form that mm. they were hoping for. Um, one ended up getting realized in a very different form and the other one sort of, I think ended up half complete and then didn't really make it to the finish line, but I, I still find found the process interesting. And so, so one of them is sort of trying to take this liturgical journey and to reshape it and say, okay, um, what can we do with grief here? What, what do people need? If we're saying we're going on a liturgical journey, are we going on a journey towards hope? Are we wanting them to experience God's sorrow, judgment? Are we going to help them to mourn for different creatures, different spaces? How are we going to tie that in with biblical narratives about nature? I think there's a lot to do with the Garden of Eden and mm. angels with flaming swords and, and things and some, some really nice and fun imagery there. Um, but sort of trying to provide a resource for people to process what they're going through, both people in the church and people outside the church, but also take them on a journey that um, that might change them in some way. And the other one was, so the Christian Age Project was a, a performance at St. Paul's Cathedral hmm. that took place um, during the pandemic, so it ended up as an online broadcast. And, and they had these sort of four different commissions for different movements. Um, I think creation, uh, ruin, recovery, what's the fourth one? Uh, I got it written down somewhere. Um, creation, ruin, recovery sounds like it covers a lot. Yeah, I'm wondering, I'm wondering what the fourth would be. And redemption, there we go. Ah. And so they had a, a different composer which who was commissioned to write each movement. And, and mm. some of those were people of faith and some people not people of faith. Mm. And each one sort of had a different spin on what they're doing with those, those different movements. So one of them, so one of the composers, she had uh, various connections with uh, friends in um, somewhere in Africa, I forget get where exactly that the, at the time of writing had been through a, a sort of ecological disaster with floods and destruction. And, and she was really interested in what it meant for those people to recover from that experience and sort of try to, and was surprised in some ways at how fast they recovered from it and wanted to incorporate that sense of solidarity with and learning from the, these, these people in her movement. Um, another one I talked to was, uh, 
had the challenge of of doing the last movement, which was meant to draw them all together. And he had a much more sort of cynical outlook on the world and, and was trying to build a sort of sense in, of irony into his piece. Like, um, I, I'm building this sense of redemption and hope, but actually maybe we're all screwed and maybe actually I'm going to end it on this note of looking like everything's shiny and happy, but make, drawing people's attention to the fact that that actually is quite superficial the way I'm doing it here. And leaving them with that sense of questioning, and and that was um, it was really interesting talking to them about that. But 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 the broader question here is that what does grief do? Right? Does it is it something personal, um, or does it do more than that? Does it? I, I mean, a, a lot of the literature you've got questions like how grief enables solidarity with with other beings with other people what what is a grievable thing is nature grievable uh, what's a grievable body and how has that traditionally been constructed and, and using this this sense of mourning to expand that community and then sort of grief as resistance right if you're if you are grieving something that some people are refusing to grieve then then mm. perhaps that's a political element to it as well so it, it's not just a sort of abstract emotional thing it, it, it's using that process of grief to do something um so to take people on a specific journey perhaps with an unexpected end but to uh, rework some of those relationships of where our emotional connections are yeah. and what we're bound together with yeah i appreciate that connection with solidarity um because it is the thing everybody has in common is that we all grieve and not everybody gets to experience a lot of joy or pleasure necessarily, but everybody has some kind of uh, suffering, right? As the Buddhists would point out, right? Suffering is kind of the common thing of all life. So when you tap into that, you're tapping into something everybody shares. And I remember um, I uh, knew a, a Buddhist uh, friend who was working on a project on grief and noted that the etymology of grief is the same as a the derivation of gravity and grief and gravity both it's this heaviness and so in a way the whole universe is grieving everything is full of this kind of this gravity and we have it and we experience it and it's very heavy and it can be very difficult but it's also something that connects us uh and so it, it does open up a space for a sort of hope but it's a hope that's mm -hmm. like well it's not cheery hope or just naive optimism but yeah. it can open up a possibility for the future yeah yeah, and I mean, not just grieving people as well, this question of how you grieve non-human yeah. beings and whether they're worthy of it is, is really something that Christianity as a tradition often struggles with, right? We, yeah. we like, Christians like talking about souls and if humans are the ones with souls and they're the ones yeah. that, that sort of have this status as a grievable object. And I, I know... I'm talking very broad brush strokes there, but I think we find it hard to know how to grieve animals, how to grieve plants, how to grieve yeah. ecosystems, and certainly how to grieve the whole planet. That's, yeah, I mean, those are big questions. Yeah, especially something like the climate, you know, the, the a relatively stable climate of like the Holocene period. You know, we have about 12,000 years of a relatively stable climate. Like that sounds like an abstract pattern of, of weather systems and so how do you grieve a climate and it's yeah it's very strange it really speaks to the theme of of your book in general of the way innovation is happening both in music and in faith climates forcing people to develop new practices and new ways of being in the world and uh grieving something like an animal is one thing grieving mass extinction of species that's that's at such another level this is something humans have really never had to go through yeah so yeah it's you know really speaks to our time that we're having to uh to innovate in all aspects of our life including... and the nice thing here though is that we've got resources to draw on right that, that's the yeah. wonderful thing about the requiem you can say okay i i want to grieve here i don't know how to grieve but maybe i can look at back at something that already exists and that people have used to process some of that that grief and not invent something new out of nothing but but tweak it and change it and push it around and and it's uh i think that's a very useful thing to be able to do yeah. 
Yeah, that really speaks to uh, what the field of religion and ecology has been about is, is like, look, we have this unprecedented environmental crisis, but look at the tremendous uh, amount of resources we have to deal with it. And so we don't have to invent it out of whole cloth. It's like, it's there. We can recover these old traditions and reevaluate them, reconstruct them. And then all of a sudden it turns out, yeah, we can actually deal with things at the scale of climate change and mass extinction, the new emotions we're feeling, the new kinds of anxiety. Uh, so yeah, it's, um, I don't know, just a really exciting project because um, I don't think I've mentioned on the podcast before, but in my master's degree, I spent a lot of time with ethnomusicology and really grew up with a lot of music, wanted to be a musician for a long time. And then noticed that that sounded like a hard career and got more into like <laughs> philosophy and religious studies and stuff. But so I've always been interested in also these not an easy career. Right. That's true. Yeah. For me, it was just like people say, do something that you love. And I was like, well, also mm -hmm. work is hard. So do something that you don't mind hating because occasionally yep. you're just going to hate your job. And I was like, I don't mind hating philosophy. It's just Plato and Aristotle and stuff. They're easy to, to dislike, but I don't like the idea of not enjoying music. So I was like, I don't, you know, I'll, I'll keep that as a fun hobby. But so I've always had it in the back of my mind that must connect to environmental stuff. And so this was just such a treat of a project to, to learn about. Thanks. And I, I would say the broader field of ecomusicology is, is such a fascinating place for me because people are doing such weird and wonderful things. I mean, in in some ways, this project opened up some wonderful new perspectives for me, but then also whilst doing it, I sort of see what the groups outside of religion and Christianity are doing. And I think, okay, this is also a lot of fun, right? And I mean, more recently, some of those things have been seeing people that are um, going out in boats with microphones and hydrophones and things and trying to play duets with whales and, mm. and things and I think, okay, you you get to do that do, do religious people get to do this too Is that, should this be what we're, we're doing this seems a lot more fun and a lot more beyond the boundaries like uh, these traditions are set for us and the, the, there's lots of those things where i think that's weird that's new that's crazy that's fun i like that and and then sort of wondering how, how far do we get to play and how far does religion get to play and how far does non-religion get to play? And, and the boundaries of both are different, I think. Mm -hmm. and, and with religion, a lot of that is to do with, okay, there are other things here that you get to enjoy that maybe you don't get to enjoy outside of those bounds. Some, some of the spirituality, some of the community, some of those narratives are, are things that are specific. But then some of those slightly more out there projects um, are things that maybe other people get to do and we get to sort of look at them and enjoy them and... Yeah. 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 No, it's exciting. I'm definitely going to be trying to keep up with this field more in the future. And, uh, and these will have to have you back on at a certain point to talk about new developments, because I'm sure we'll see a lot more in, in the coming years, because uh, it is such a huge part of being human is, is both spirituality and music. It's, you know, very fundamental to all of our cultures. And so how, how we're adapting to our new situation, it's, there's a lot, a lot going on there especially duets with whales. That's incredible. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm going to, I need to look some of this stuff up. I've got all kinds of notes of things I need to look up now. Yeah. I mean, I do hope we get to see more that, that that's sort of one of the things that anxiety is doing this project. Was this a sort of brief flourishing of something that people got excited about and then drop? Was mm. this a moment, a flash in the pan and it's all going to come to nothing when none of it goes mainstream or is this the start of a much longer process of, working and trying things out and going in different directions and honestly i don't know well that's a very honest response uh because uh, yeah i just sometimes get uh overly enthusiastic and optimistic i'm like no it's going to keep increasing it's going to keep getting better and it'll help us solve the climate crisis and the world will be just perfect in just 10 years <laughs> and it's like well or who knows uh, so yeah, there's still a lot of uncertainty as to as to what the future is going to bring. Well, I know in the more immediate future, uh, a kind of final question: What's next for you now that you have this project kind of wrapping up? Do you have anything that you're kind of excited about, or just kind of have some downtime for a little bit? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it's a question I think about a lot. Um, <laughs> as I've been developing this project, one of the things that has really got me excited is. Um, yeah, like for many university staff, 
teaching these things with students and um, seeing how they respond because every time I teach it they they come up with things and push in directions that I wasn't expecting and and we do something there that that keeps me going and finding something new that's not a big project but it's something that's emerged out of this which which has really pushed it into new areas and contributed to it um i i'm also thinking okay i've written this and this is something i want to be not just a book that sits on people's shelves and so i'm trying to think about the different ways i can maybe use some of the things i i've learned from it to engage with different groups different communities and I, i'm still finding out what the possibilities are there yeah. um Part of me at this point sort of wants to expand beyond music too, because one of the th constant things that's happening in this book is you're sort of realizing music points to so many other dynamics and and ties into so many different things beyond itself. And th this sort of broader question of, I'm sort of thinking about the project at the moment to do with spirituality and conservation and, and how, how it might, might make sense to look at some different conservation projects with that sort of lens of spirituality in mind. And I'm sort of toying with ideas in my head and seeing, is that a good idea? Is that not a good idea? And, and sort of trying them out and, and see whether any of them turn into anything. Yes. Yeah. Those are all, all good avenues for the future. Um, so yeah, we will see the future is of course uncertain, but I definitely uh, think we have a lot more to chat about. So we'll have to do this again sometime. I'd love to. All right, cool. Well, Mark Porter, thank you so much for making time for us. And again, the name of the book is For the Warming of the Earth, Music, Faith, and Ecological Crisis. Uh, so thanks so much. This is really, really a joy. Thanks so much, Sam. Enjoyed it. Uh, and thanks for everyone for tuning in. And uh, whether you're watching or listening, uh, definitely appreciate it. And uh, we'll be back with some more conversations for you soon. In the meantime, take care and be well.